Hello and welcome to this episode of Think Like a Negotiator, a mind meld alternative, I want to say, something like that. My wonderful, amazing guest today is Peter van Sel, Pete for short. He is currently living in New Zealand, but he is originally from South Africa. Currently, he's working as a senior architect and security specialist of almost 15 years of experience in the IT field. He's focused on cybersecurity and architecture because living in those areas has provided him with the insight into multiple networks. Understanding the network has enabled him to not only build secure infrastructure for clients or businesses, but also understand where possible vulnerabilities reside. He's able to move through a network almost regardless of industry because of his exposure to a vast amount of systems, giving him the ability to effectively either protect a business or person or be able to find a vulnerability to exploit. Peter, thank you for joining me. And uh, thanks for reaching out and agreeing to do this. This is awesome. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. I appreciate it as well. It's yeah. quite good to have this. See you again. Yeah. So for those not in the know, right, because we've got secrets, it's <laughs> we've actually, we grew up together mostly. Uh, we went to high school together and haven't seen him in 10 years, 15 years, something like that. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> yeah, more or less. A long time. But, you know, <laughs> friends stay friends. And it's actually wonderful because when I started with the negotiating thing on Facebook, Peter said, he was like, this is exactly how social engineering works. And so he basically gave me a rundown of what he does. And it's actually pretty cool. I don't know my backside from my hand when it comes to IT, but you know, this is a man who's an expert. And so he basically puts himself as a sort of ethical hacker, which is sort of like a, a blue team versus red team sort of thing. Can you maybe just elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, so um, uh, elaborating a little bit on the red team, blue team comment, um, when we talk about ethical hacking, you um, can be part of what is called said red team or blue team. Red team is more of the, call it the assault kind, the, they would attack a network, attack infrastructure, um, try and breach it via vulnerabilities, stuff like that, discover vulnerabilities, um, enumerate data, that kind of thing. Um, versus if we talk about a blue team, we would be talking defensive protection, setting up firewalls, protecting against certain things, um, installing patches, updates, finding vulnerabilities and patching them out. So that's basically the focus. And in terms of ethical hacking, what I do, I try and focus on both fronts, like you said. Um, the idea with that is mainly because I act as more of a blue team member, but understanding the red team is insightful because you would automatically know what to do and what to protect against. Plus, as part of my role and um, staff that we outsource from, from my company, um, we do penetration testing and testing clients' network infrastructure from either from the side of the road over the wireless or even from the internet over IPs and try and see where they're vulnerable, give them an audit report, tell them, listen, this is what's wrong. This is what needs to be done. These are the potential projects we look at and this is the amount of exposure that's out there. So yeah, brief rundown. Well, so this is basically like a, a digital audit. Uh, yeah. Like if financial audit would come in and poke holes, you know, to see where the vulnerabilities lie and all kinds of things. And this is basically for your IT infrastructure, which is what most businesses run on these days. So yeah. it's actually quite a, is it a, is it a very competitive field? Well, I would say publicity wise, yes. But I mean, um, I've been working with IT360 now in New Zealand, like you said, um, for about almost four years. And I would say there's about two big competitors, including us, which makes it one, <laughs> which is really active in this field. So the other guys aren't really out there that much. It's not something that is either seen as important by clients or seen as important by a lot of um, MSSPs in the, in the industry to actually actively push this. Um, though it is, in my opinion, one of the most important parts because you can work security into everything, regardless if it's seen as ah, not into the old pen test thing or whatever, but giving a, a report on your infrastructure from well, let's put it this way. As a, as a company owner, if your IT provider gave you such a report, regardless if you had to pay for it or got it for free or whatever the case is, just them showing you what your infrastructure is like, you can plan your next year, three year IT investment based on that that was discovered. Plus, 
no matter how good your current IT company is, tomorrow there's a new exploit, new vulnerability, new technology that can be implemented. How would you know that you're supposed to invest in said things if you can't see such an audit as a as something that's critical? And that's actually quite interesting because, like I said, now most businesses basically run online. It's a digital world now, right? So I think people sort of missed the point of calling it the fourth industrial revolution. I think they should be calling it the digital revolution because right yes. now, if you're not online, you might as well not exist. <laughs> and this is just me talking now from a, I want to say a, a developed world sort of mindset that it's, a, it's an intention economy, right? So you need to be out there, you need to be public, you need to be visible, and you need to be able to grab attention. How do you go about actually explaining the necessity of having an IT infrastructure and having someone come in and do an IT audit, basically, of your security system? So, well, we're lucky enough that we've got a good set of sales guys. So <laughs> they, they're able to, let's say, translate sometimes my technical wording. Your techno into, babble. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, actually, the the CEO uh, Dave, he's he sometimes even in some of the meetings he says warning technical guy on site. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite funny, but um, a little bit more to the point. The the idea is that th this the pitch would be um, from one or two aspects because there would be a goal behind said audit. Number one. If you're after doing a roadmap for your company where you need to invest your IT, where you can be saving money to get more money to invest in better technology, because that's one of the biggest things that do happen. Um, a little bit earlier, I gave you that example of MFA, so multi-factor authentication, where a lot of people see it as, ah, oh, that's horrible. You're gonna be introducing something complex. I don't want it. I don't wanna to listen to about it, but if you implement that right, it's actually going to make the client's um, experience seamless. Um, it'll be logging in once with using their face and a push notification on a mobile phone, and they don't have to log in again, versus currently they'd be typing their password on four different websites, and they made it the same password because they don't want to be bothered to remember six different complex passwords. Um, so. Yeah, the, the one angle is roadmap in, uh, investing in your anti infrastructure, gaining money back. The other side is if your company was to be hit by, I don't know, a ransomware attack or someone hacked your network, got your data, put it out on the web, how much would you have lost and would your clients come back if they realized that? Mm. So how important is that for you to do a, a audit, which depending how far you want to go, can take from two days to three weeks um, to get that information to know what to patch. Because, I mean, from an SA mentality, we all put burglar bars on our windows because people break through windows. And now that we do that, they break in through the roofs by lifting tiles. So wow. how would you know, where would you need to go to right. really know these vulnerabilities? Because I asked in the pre-interview as well, do you solely focus on the IT infrastructure or do you also do the user interface or the user experience? And you said a little bit of both because you need to understand how to, how to negotiate between what is needed and what is efficient. So because tapping in five different parts with the five different sites is not an efficient way of running a business, right? So as an IT professional, you need to be able to understand the, the connection between having something that works, works properly without giving up too much of what is considered, you know, proper IT security, but also not neglecting the user experience. Because if it takes 10 tries to get into one thing, you're not going to do it. People are lazy. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's, if, we, if we think about it, um, using sort of carrying on with the protecting your house analogy, Technically, you can just put a dome of reinforced, I don't know, 20 millimeter thick steel plates around your entire house and don't have any windows or anything. And technically, you're protected, but that's not efficient. That's yeah. not <laughs> what anyone wants to do. So it's sec good security is definitely one thing, but you will become a roadblock. It, it, you are seen as a roadblock already. So you're just enforcing that mentality. Whereas if you spend time with the client, and 
really understand what their needs are, you can find that good sweet spot in between implementing the said security as well as really, I can say, focusing on the either um, time investment, uh, monetary gain or whatever that, that aspect is and really try and improve on it. So they would be spending money, but gaining time back because they spend the money and they became secure. So that's sort of the, the payoff in the end. And at the end of the day, a company that's more secure is a company that you trust, right? You know, that little green HTTPS, you know, <laughs> next to next to the domain name on Google, right? Yeah. You trust that company. It's just a, it's just something that happens now. Whereas if a site says, like you said, actually in a pre-interview, if it says the site is not secure, you're not going to go there. Yeah. Right. doesn't matter what's on there. You don't want to have that risk. And I think a lot of people have the same sort of mindset. If it says not secure, then it's not for me. Yes. So exactly. to be able to yes, negotiate exactly. between the user experience and the security, it is essential. And you don't know what you don't know. And that's why an IT report is so, an IT audit is so valuable. I mean, worst case scenario, you can just, if most of these days, every company is going through some kind of chain of audits or questionnaires to be some kind of accredited with something. And I want to say that almost all of these, call it questionnaires, contain some kind of audit questionnaire. So were you audited? What was discovered? What are you doing about said breaches? They don't really care how, sec how secure you, you say you are, they just sort of want some kind of report. So that also really or tailors to that element as well. Right, because as you said, you know, tomorrow you might not be secured, right? It's a constantly changing world. So to yeah. me, if you say it's like, you know, I've implemented this and I've done this and I've done this, right? It gives me more value than saying we are secured because it shows to me that you've got a growth mindset, that you're constantly making yes. improvements, constantly trying to check and constantly doing something to make sure that you stay up to date and secure. So if I don't really care if you were secured or not secured or whatever like that, right? What have you done in between A to B to help your company grow in a digital scale to protect your customers and your data and all kinds of things? Mm. So that's actually very interesting because it's something that I don't think a lot of people think about is you know, and I, I include myself in this because my website was basically just a digital flyer, you know, just like a, <laughs> I mean, you would print and hand out on a digital scale. Uh, yeah. But, you know, the more active you become, the more things you add on, you know, you have to become better and it shows a growth mindset. Exactly. You know, and it's when you protect yeah. yourself, you're also protecting your client's data, which you are then responsible for as well on top of everything. So. Exactly. And we all know the security risks of compromised data. You know, it's like, it's, yeah. it's just, uh, <laughs> and with that said now, I was, I had a while back, a mind melt interview with Chris von Selbosov. And he, we talked about IT industry as well. And one of the questions came up of, uh, do you think IT or the industry rather is, is a creative industry? And he said he doesn't see it. He doesn't see it like that. He sees the individual more creative than the industry itself. But I was wondering what's your thoughts on that, in a different perspective now across the world, basically, in what we yeah. would consider a developed country. Exactly. It's. Um, I mean, coming from SA, I would somewhat agree because I would say it's a it's a very um, to the dollar mentality. So mm -hmm. you don't really have room for creativity, especially if it's going to cost more, mm -hmm. you would rather substitute the creativity to save money. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you talk about places like Australia or New Zealand, it's almost, it's almost a different perspective completely. Um, creativity is seen as an asset um, that's based from a company's perspective, the technology you implement, or even the engineer, and or salesperson, guide, lady, doesn't matter, whoever they are and the company, whoever they are, both being creative is actually a really good thing. And if we talk about the, the MFA piece, creativity really walks the, in there in, in that element where you're finding a creative way to breach 
the really technical side and then what the user experience or the user expectation is your view uh, the user interface area that you spoke about finding something that works well in both areas you need to be creative because mm -hmm. it's easy to find the cheapest piece of technology and implement it but is that what they need it maybe is it what they want probably not mm. but to find the way is where the creativity really needs to be a factor in my opinion right so coming back to your house analogy it doesn't help you make yourself so secure that you basically build yourself a prison. Yeah, correct. So, you know, you need to have room for both and you need to be able to incorporate it in a seamless way. For example, I don't yes. even think about two factor authentication now. It's just something that happens. It is not something that bothers me. If I open up my laptop and it scans my face to unlock the thing, you know, it's like, it's not something that actually bothers me, but it's so essential mm -hmm. and it doesn't get in the way. And I think that's yes. the key here. And I want to know now, from a uh, uh, from a sociological sort of point of view, the difficulties and the challenges of dealing with people in non IT uh, in non IT industries. So I would say, um, from a non IT industry or perspective, it is it is somewhat complex, somewhat hard because explaining them the risks is sometimes it's probably the the biggest hurdle to overcome. Um, and that's the, the easiest way to show that to them is where the entire social engineering thing comes from. Um, I mean, we will talk about it a little bit later, but if we, if we look at um, how we can utilize social engineering to get around staff members and that kind of thing, it's if you walk up to someone with even as, as something as simple as just a ladder in your hand, if you are adamant to get through the door with the ladder in your hand, you've got some kind of, I don't know, work related attire on, they would just open up the door and let you in because they're expecting, ah, you're probably here to change a light or something. They won't ask questions, nothing. So that entire security part has just been bypassed. Mm. Um, most of the time, a lot of companies do protect themselves with firewalls or whatever the case is, but the moment you're inside the network, it's a completely different thing. So that's, let's call it physical social engineering side is one small little element out of everything out there and to get staff members to understand or employees to understand that aren't IT literate, which there's a lot of, and that's normal. I mean, everyone's got their field of industry, their field of expertise. Um, but to get them to understand there's ways we can do training, that kind of thing. It's, it is actually a recommendation from our side. Um, but that's also where, we try and implement areas to try and do it for them instead of them having to think. So for example, if we talk about a, I don't know, a phishing email coming in, we would implement multiple layers of checks for that email before it goes through from Microsoft's advanced rate protection to, I don't know, WatchGuard's firewall with um, scanning technology to staff training. And even if they were breached for whatever reason, if they've got multi-factor authentication, it's already really hard for said um, um, advanced uh, uh, threat to really make an impact on their network because they don't have that factor to authenticate against. Mm. So we build the layer so that they don't need to be as well educated if that is the reasoning. We make it easy for them so that they don't need to be bothered with that but we also still provide that training to make sure that they do understand what is out there because this reaches further than what a lot of people would realize. Yeah, they think, oh, hackers, computers sitting in the dark typing. Nah, I would say that majority of the places that I've done SA and here, I didn't even have to do it from, my, from somewhere behind a PC. I just walked into the building, plugged something into the network and I was in. It, it's done, I was on site behind you, behind your reception counter. It's not that hard. And that is where I want to say the, um, the touch of your book and where um, social engineering comes in, uh, they sort of play the same thing because you get away with a lot of things that you talk about and the way you speak and the way you present yourself to get away with things that they don't realize you're getting away with, so. Because one of the things that you said was that basically you, you test security from a person point of view as well. Meaning you actually go to the site and you play to their perceptions. Yes. So what you said now is like, if you are in work overalls and you're carrying a ladder to, 
to the left. There was Questy here. There was Ark. It's like, should you be here, right? Yep. And I actually thought, I touched on that in my book as well, is to play to people's perceptions of who you are or who you should be, right? Yep. So use that to your advantage. So I actually find it quite fascinating. Basically, you work as a spy. <laughs> yes, yes that, that's exactly it. And, and the funny thing is that you'd be surprised how many people are doing it. You would never know because it's, it's sort of seen as a social hack to, oh, I can get away with things if I just word it the right way. Yes, it's basic neuro linguistic <laughs> programming on its fine. Yes. And it's, it's just understanding how to, how to leverage people, their thoughts, their feelings, you know, and it's all kinds of communication skills, all kinds of things. It's actually quite fascinating, and I really love talking about this sort of stuff, is mm. that there's no substitute really for thinking. Because as much security as you have, right, people are still vulnerable if they do not get educated, which is why you have to educate the people as well. And that is what I love. It's not just do it for you. It's training you how to not bother me again with this sort of nonsense. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. So, for example, just yesterday, I got, a, I got an email saying my OneDrive has been... Uh, has been compromised Classic. and I need to click here on the shortened bit link, right? And then I can, you know, sort it out and stuff like that. As I said, okay, first of all, I don't go clicking on shortened links. <laughs> right? Rather type in, type in the address. So manual. what I do is I just, I right click the link and then I, they say, there's a site that you can just unshorten the link. Yes, and yes. So then I, then I can see what it is. So it said like something Microsoft dot OneDrive dot something dot something dot something. It's like, you know, it's like that's way too long. So okay, it's like, it might be legit. Let's just check. And I saw it came from a Gmail address. It's like, <laughs> would Microsoft send me a message from a Gmail account? Uh, it doesn't seem likely. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they're using the Gmail suite now because I don't know what. <laughs> it's free probably or whatever. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's so broke. <laughs> 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 and then you look at the wording and the constant misspellings and all kinds of things and it's like look this is clearly a scam this is clearly something suspicious for my information delete because sometimes things do get past the the default system the security system so it's, and that's the point yeah and that's and even on a physical person that comes to you wearing something that a printed t-shirt whatever right because perceptions matter and if you look like you know what you're doing, you're going to get farther than the guy who doesn't look like you know what he's doing. If you can communicate exactly. better, think more, not just different, because I hate people saying you need to think different or think outside the box. It's like, you know, it's like, <laughs> give me a break, right? It's thinking better, just that one extra step that somebody else hasn't thought of. It's like, look, this place is so secure, we can't breach it, we can't hack it. But then a guy just in overalls of a laptop comes in and plugs it into one of the one of the routers and there you go mm. right they got on-site access to everything you've got now and that's really amazing because you need to be able to understand yeah so i covered this as one of my top 10 tips at the end of the book as well is don't let other people do your thinking for you you need to think for yourself and i really love this because yeah. it's just like it so speaks to everything that i believe in that uh that you don't have to make a compromise when it comes to security safety but also uh, fun and user experience and all kinds of things and it's like really wonderful so thank you that's amazing um just a little bit still on top of it there is a um there's a podcast that i listen to uh called darknet diaries guy jack resider um i sent you a link to one specific one i would i would really encourage you to listen to you're probably going to listen to everything it's about i think 50 60 episodes okay. really good it's when I listened to the first one, referral from a friend of mine, and it, it was just, I got hooked in, instantly. Um, it's a little bit back when I listened to the one, but it's, it's, it's called, um, I have it actually here, um, the Beirut Bank Job. So what it is, is um, <laughs> it's a guy that um, basically socially engineered his way into a bank. And just the way that he did it was genius because it's as simple as that putting up the friendly face putting up the expectation of how do you think this person wants someone to be for them to allow because um, i made a comment to one of your posts where society actually society parents whatever that is shows us and cinema as well shows us 
when someone spills a coffee on us, we have to be angry, we have to mm. be mad, we have to react of, oh, you stupid imbecile, blah, mm. blah, blah. Whereas if you just react in a nice, friendly manner, you're going to get away with so much more because even that person is expecting you to be angry. And the moment you react in a polite manner, you would just, they would just, their walls would be broken down because they don't know what to do now. They would just um, re uh, return in kind. So they would go and return kindness with kindness. And that's where the snowball goes. Yeah. So this isn't in the um, book, but as a as a added example, um, there was this company. Uh, it's a coffee house who spilled drink on me, mm. right? So it was uh, just a waitress that's trying to do a job and all kinds of things, and it was just very busy. And someone knocked her over, and then the coffee ended up on me. You know, it it's not pleasant, but it's not her fault, right? So then the manager came in and expected me to be all accidents upset. Happen. All, yeah, accidents happen, right? Aspect which you all upset. It's like nobody died, right? It's fine. But I use that opportunity to negotiate for something else. Like, look, um, can I treat, can I, because now the one guy was all, you know, like he's raging on the spoiler of and that's trying to do a job about how she's the clumsy idiot that bumped into him, which is not true, but you know. Yes. And then she lost her cool and she started yelling back. Yes. And that sort of just escalated the situation. Then I came in with a clear, calm voice. As the victim here, I think I would like to add, <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm the worst one here. I'm the worst one here, right? Keeping my calm, keeping my cool, and diffuse the situation. And then the manager came and was like, you know, it's like, we'll give you this and give me this. Like, please don't do this. It's like, it's fine. Maybe we can just have a sit down right now. And I can teach your staff how to better communicate with people. And so then they hired me as a consultant on communication skills and thinking skills and public relations and all kinds of things. And so what I did was instead of getting angry at something, I used the opportunity to leverage something else that I wanted. I saw yes. an opportunity and it's easy to get mad about something, but it's only the guy who thinks like a negotiator, the person who thinks like a negotiator, I need to get my pronouns right now. It's the <laughs> person who thinks like a negotiator that sees an opportunity and Correct. creates a win-win situation. Yes. And, and that's basically on, social engineering. Exactly. And on that is if most people would always respond in kind. So if you're mm. angry at them, if you're shouting at them, the odds of them shouting back is really high. Mm. You would want to, as a, um, let's call it the animal side of you, the, the hunter side would always be, I need to dominate you so that you can listen to me yes. versus if you, if you, approach from a ah oh, don't worry all is good you you taking the lower way from a um, higher key perspective and it's almost never seen so it's exactly that yeah um just well, a little bit on 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 the, yes, on, the on the podcast sorry, you, yeah yeah so um with specifically that bank job i mean the guy he walked into the building asked where the bathroom is and he went to the bathroom that's behind the the sort of behind reception everything else and then after he was there, he came back. And now that he's approaching from a, let's call it a vulnerable side, he's more susceptible to, ah, oh, he's already supposed to be here. Versus if you're coming in from the door, people are a little bit more, you, who are you, where are you trying to go? Um, he basically walked to the manager's office, just stood there. The manager was busy with someone else, just looked at them, manager nodded at them, all good, looked at the reception. Then he walked to reception from the manager's office. He didn't speak to the manager at all. The reception lady just ex assumed that the manager approved said person because he walked from the manager's office. Right. The manager did do some kind of nod, which if I look at you, I nod, you nod back because right. it's, it's international sign of hello. <laughs> it's, it's not, yes, you can take the money or whatever. Um, she then just allowed him, oh, he said, I'm here to just check a few things on your PC. He's like, oh, yeah, come behind the counters of the bank. Yeah, you can plug something into the, the machine. Yeah, and all good. He at one point picked up a PC and walked out just because he could. He just, it was part of the test. Um, 
the the one um, I think the the one manager came to him. Uh, I f like I forget the story because some time ago I listened to it. But he then asked, "Oh, there's a printer issue." He said, "No, don't worry. We're going to refresh the whole network. We're going <laughs> to else." And can I have a look? So yeah, come to my PC. He went he went to the manager PC, plugged in his stick to the manager's PC, compromised that as well. And it just shows you how far you can get just by walking from the better area, let alone speaking. Let a, he's, a, he's a nice guy. You, you, when you listen to him, because he's, he's actually part of, he, he talks through it as well. You would think, oh, this is a guy I want to befriend. Mm -hmm. And approach someone like that, and you're halfway there already, in my opinion. Let alone what you want to do. And um, if you give something up and make the response they give you something that you engineered and they think they're supposed to say that you're on a really good win scenario because I've already given you something. So you feel obligated by social standard to give something back. I mean, last year for your birthday, I give you, a, I gave you a gift. So this year for my birthday, you feel obligated to give me a gift. It's, it's, it's a, it's a thing. It's a that basic you law of reciprocity. Yeah. Yes. And giving and someone a pen. As well. Yeah, exactly. Right. Which is why the waitress gives you, I shouldn't say waitress, the, the, the server, right, <laughs> gives, you, uh, gives you those little sweeties, right, in your, in yes. your, in your check. Because it's, this actually study been done that by giving you those little, those little treats, right, you actually tip higher, tip more than if you didn't get it. You got something for free. I yeah. should give you. I should give you something. Extra. Which is why, yeah. as part of test passes, what I did was I started printing stickers. It cost me like fifty cents, fifty million cents for a sticker, right? But our conversion rate skyrocketed because, yes. of, and I and I, it's going to be because of the stickers because nothing else worked up to that point. So I started holding yes. more events, create more interest, and then I gave them something for free, and then they just signed up because now they got a sticker. And what I did was they. <laughs> They put that sticker on their car and now it's free advertising. Yes, yes, right? exactly. Which is why I don't wear I don't wear anything that's not my own branding. It's like if you can see here, like, right? <laughs> so I don't wear clothes that's not my own branding unless I'm getting yes. paid for it. Because I refuse to go promote somebody else. Because they especially like pick. because if you think Nike, right? How brilliant is it? You pay them to advertise their brand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And as you walk, you're like, oh, look at my new shoes. Yes. They're expensive because it's, expensive. it's like, oh, it's I need those expensive shoes in my life. <laughs> and it's that's like, you know, monkey see, monkey do. That's probably a better word for it. But it's but just go back to the perceived perceptions, back to people's perceptions. I was living in Wellington. My flatmate at that time kicked me out. Uh, he, he had his girlfriend coming from Ireland and it's like, no, it's like, there's no room for all of us. Right. <laughs> it's like, okay, I understand. Okay. So, uh, so I had to go. Why did he pick his girlfriend over you? Well, you know, it's like, I don't know. I'm pretty. <laughs> I'm more, I'm good Irish. <laughs> and um, so, and uh, then I went and I stayed at, uh, I probably shouldn't name it. Oh, oh no, anyway, Capital City Lodge. And I want to make sure that this isn't like a lodge for tourists. My room at the lodge was basically as big as a cupboard. Sure. I was broke. I had nothing. You know, I could barely afford paying my rent. And right across the street was the bread factory. And I'm going to say tip top bread factory, but I might just take that out. <laughs> And it was, and it's like every morning they bake this fresh bread and it's like, it just smells, it just smells something incredible. And so I decided to try my luck one day. I just go in, I take one of the lab coats, right? I put it on. I, I grab the clipboard from the office at the lodge and I just go around. I need to, I need to talk to you about the clipboard, by the way, but carry on, sorry. Right. And I just walk around and I, and I touch things and I, it's like, look at this and I, you know, it's like kicking this and, <laughs> Printing on this, and I'm making some remarks here. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm drawing cartoons on my clipboard here, but they don't need to say that. Yeah. So it's like, okay, when's the last time this was clean? When was the last time this was done? All kinds of things. And because New Zealanders have such a a helpful attitude, I want to say almost, right? Yep. That definitely. they don't question us. Like, who the hell are you? What are you doing here? <laughs> well, you because what I did was 
Um, and so the next day, they questioned who I was, right? And said, okay, look, I'll, I forgot my vest at home. It's no problem. I'll just bring it tomorrow. Yes. And so for like the next two weeks, I, caught, I went in and I grabbed myself two loaves of bread every day. And I went back to the lodge in my little cupboard of a room. <laughs> I had some sandwiches. And then later on, I was like, I had to up my game because then I was sort of getting suspicious because I never, I constantly forget my, my ID card. So You're already part of the furniture already, but anyway. So, so I went to the manager's office and I asked him, could I just use your computer for, you know, five minutes. And in Microsoft Paint, I created myself a, a name badge that said Inspector Gadget. But it wasn't gadget, right? It was gadget because I had an accent <laughs> on the E. And when they said gadget, I got so offended. It's gadget. It's gadget. It's like every time, every time, it's not gadget, it's Inspector Gadget. Don't call me Inspector Gadget. Do I look like a cartoon to you? I'm so sorry, sir. It's like, please. He was like, there's no, there's no problem. From then on, nobody questioned who I was. And everybody just called me Gazette. Gazette, Inspector, Inspector Gazette. It's like, yo, <laughs> <Kia ora. laughs> And um, playing into people's perceived values and what they expect you to be, it, mm. it really it greases the wheels of negotiation, I want to say. Definitely. You want to talk about clipboards? Uh, um, so two things. If you ever, if you ever aspire to be some, everyone listening as well, ever aspire to be some kind of pen tester, physical pen tester, that kind of thing, I elaborate a little bit on that. You can get a what I call um, so, Am I back? Sorry. Yes, you're I think back. I broke okay. up there. Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know where what, where I was with the discussion. So okay, so we're just starting with pen test. So can you explain pain test? Yeah, so, so um, when we talk about a pain tester, I can say you can get a virtual pain tester and a physical pain tester. So virtual would be um, over the internet, that kind of thing, finding vulnerabilities through a firewall, maybe phishing campaign, that kind of thing, easy. When we talk about a physical pain test, it's actually going on site, trying to hack the wireless, trying to social engineer your way into site, that kind of thing. So when you do physical pen test, Getting like a clipboard, maybe building in um, a card reader or a card duplicator so that when you walk into a building, so the ladder analogy, clipboard analogy works the same thing. If you've yeah. got a clipboard in hand, people expect like, ah, oh, this guy is here to do something. He's important. And most of the time you can just walk up to someone, ask, hey, so you're part of the security or access or whatever the case are. Ah, can I just take a note of your name and, and the details? You put the card on your clipboard, clone it, and then write, make sure you write down some details, walk through, and now you've got a cloned car to actually enter somewhere in the building. Wow. So that's that's a really easy one. Um, but there's a, another another part of Jack's um, Darknet Diaries where there's a guy um, that talked about, he started his own cybersecurity company, and his mother, which was an old lady at the time, um, she unfortunately passed away, but she talks about it in, in the audio uh, in the podcast and um, she is actually was she was really interested in actually becoming a physical pen tester as well so you can just imagine this 50 60 year old lady <laughs> going oh I want to be a pen tester but because she was she did food safety at one point in time she actually hit a really important food safety company uh, a food company and um, in the um, well the food industry mm. food and beverage industry and she went and she not only got the implants done and actually managed to hack them, you can physically pen penetrate them. But she also did a, a, a audit running through the building and did a proper <laughs> audit and actually gave them a rating and explained to the guy, ah, oh, this is what you should do to prevent it. Got access to his PC, plugged into the manager's system, stuff like that, which was, it's brilliant. You should, I'll send you the link to that one as well. But it is that way. Imagine an old lady walking to you, telling you, listen, I'm here to do an inspection. You would probably, regardless of a name tag or anything, mm -hmm. allow her in because what the heck is she going to do? You know, is that perception right. and, again? Of and I think to myself now, just the other day, someone came here and said, no, he's from the electrical company and he had a jacket on all kinds of things, but I never questioned it. It could have been easily <laughs> somebody that had no connection with the electrical company. And I just say, oh, of course, yeah, here's the, here's the key to the office. Just make yourself at yeah. home, this cup of tea over there, <laughs> right? No problem. 
Yep. I'll, I'll see you in 20 minutes. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving, so I'm just leaving lock now. up when you're yeah, done. Yeah, exactly, right? And uh, it's like, look, Matt's here if you need anything. And, you know, just, uh, just make yourself comfortable. It's fine. Whereas what I should have done was call the electrical company and say, look, uh, there's a guy standing here in front of me. This is the work order. I need to see a work permit or a work order yes. or something, right, that I can question. Because if you are, and look, I keep telling people, it's like, there's nothing to steal, you know. You can steal my ideas, but, you know, you still need to do something with it. So, um, <laughs> but, but, but it's interesting because there's so many of us, and I include myself in this, that don't question things enough. And you have the right to question things. If you're not secure, yes, if you're not you sure, do. question. There's, there's no, nobody should take an offense. The moment someone takes offense to you questioning them, yeah. then you actually should be red lighting it. Yeah. Because if you're supposed to be there, you would prepare everything that you could to be there regardless, because you don't want that awkward situation of being sent back, mm. wasting the company's time that you're working for. It's, it's almost a given. So... Because, you know, if you are in a secure building and you need access to all kinds of things and you just get in, right, that's a big compromise that you now, that's a big security risk that you now have. And because like the security guards in this building, I come in frequently and I keep thinking, it's like, I don't need to sign the register, right? I could just walk past, right? I don't need to scan whatever. And it's like, no one checks on, no one also checks that what you're writing there is legit. Correct. I, I tested the other day and I wrote, um, uh, I have wrote Hannibal Lecter and <laughs> uh, my number was uh, some sort of weird number. I think it was pi, uh, 1.14159, oh, yeah. something like that, right? And my signature was just an X. And I looked at it and just said, okay. <laughs> like, no one questions that Hannibal Lecter <laughs> with X writing pi, you know, <laughs> it goes in. And because people don't want to seem stupid, I think. They don't yes. want to, yes. and that's what also in IT, this other woman, she asked me, it's like, what's it going to take to do this and this and this? And it's like, what you're asking for is going to be expensive, right? Because basically you want to connect these three computers together, but what you want really, because what you're asking me to do now is install this entire framework to connect these three things together, whereas what you could have just done was use OneDrive or, you know, Dropbox or something to yes. share the files across devices, which is going to be yes. cheaper. You know, it's going to cost you nothing. So no, 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 we need to have this and this and this. It's like, uh oh, this woman just read a bunch of things. And it's like now, right. So I said, okay, but have you thought about the TCP IP settings for your Vodacom <laughs> uh, initial 4G <laughs> Wi-Fi? which a bunch of words seems legit, but when he questions, it's like, it doesn't make any sense, right? Blank. Blank. And he said, yeah, of course, I've, of course. I've, I've, the TCP IP settings, of course I've done that. Right, right, right. Now, have you cloned the subsection masking system of the 195? Yes, yes, we've done that. We've got all this covered. I see. It's like, I'm not even sure what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I don't know what you're agreeing to. <laughs> so it's like, I'm just grabbing words out of my head. So I don't know what you're agreeing to. But clearly, you just don't want to seem foolish now. And yeah. at the end of the day, all it took was to, if you just ask, like, look, please just explain this to me in a, in a way that I can understand. Exactly. But people, and I think because IT has that, you have that mentality of IT people are difficult to work with. Uh, yes. They, they, they should. Big stigma. And, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a, it's an unfortunate stigma and, and it's not that it's not true because sometimes it's difficult to explain what you know to someone who doesn't, yes. who doesn't understand even the basic concepts. Right. Exactly. Which is why, you know, have you tried turning it off and on again is such a thing. Right? <laughs> and why it works because it, it works. Because it does work. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so when, or like, you know, when someone calls me, it's like, come fix this computer. It's not turning on at all. It's like before I now get off of my chair and, you know, go away from my work to come help you fix your computer, let's just ask some questions. Have you tried turning off and on again? It's like, it doesn't turn on at all. Is it plugged in? Yeah, it's plugged in. Is it switched on? Yeah, but it doesn't turn on off. I mean, at the wall. Is it switched on at the wall? And it's like, and you click. It's like, yeah, no, it was switched on. It's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I've even oh. heard the, the scenario and, where I asked them, it's like, oh, is it switched on? It's like, yeah, it's like, is there lights in the building? No, there's a power outage at the moment. It's like, yeah. So then why do you think you could pick it with me? <laughs> It's like, do you have, it's like, I just, um, and then I, I make the mistake of when, when someone phones, I legitimately almost run through those questions really quick where it's like, okay, so your PC is struggling to, to switch on. Do you, is there a power outage at the moment? And a lot of people take offense to that sometimes, but it is a question that I sort of have to ask. It's a question that ask. you have to ask because there are people who don't think that, you know, your PC is powered yes. by electricity. It's yes, powered exactly. by magical thoughts of wellness. <laughs> It's powered by bureaucracy. I don't know. It's like, look, I don't know what sort of PC you have, but most of us work on electricity. So if there's no power in your building, there's no power for the PC. But it does, and I can understand why people have to take a face because, but what my, my problem is that if I come to you and I've, and I've already told you what I've tried, right? That should not mean that you now go and you should try and think of something else, yes, right? Yes, yes. And so what he does is like, and look, I'm fine if you try what I tried uh, uh, again, but don't do it in front of me, right? Don't, because it's like, it's like, no, I've tried to reposition the, the graphics card and I took out the RAM and I cleaned the fans. It's like, it's not switching on, you know, it's like, uh, I've tried a different, uh, uh, I've tried a different power supply, a different PSU, you know, it's like, uh, and it's like, it's not working. I'm not sure what's happening here. Right, it's like, okay, have you tried repositioning the graphics card? Didn't I just say this? It's like, didn't I just it say this? part of the whole discussion. Like, this is just in my head. Did I not say this? <laughs> this is just something that I was thinking. Like, did I just imagine your voice as well? And it's like, look, if you want to test it by all means, but don't do it in front of me. Right, and that's just, we, we're sort of getting off subject about negotiation, no, no. Things, but it's still, it's still just like, it's something that, that annoys me. But if something so, happens to you, yeah. don't just get mad. Yes. Find a way to use the opportunity to negotiate for something else. Maybe a free yes. meal, maybe you know, an extra meal, or maybe a if you're like me and you do training or you need something done, you know, negotiate for a sit down and, and see what you can sell. And exactly. it's it's that easy. Sometimes just asking for something gets you more than what you thought you would. Walked into a walked to a front desk. Funny enough, I, I managed to get to to the sort of the back area where this front desk was because I, I exploited a. There's there's also sort of getting a bit track. The where we said our uh, people don't want to seem ignorant. They also don't want to seem that they forgot someone. So mm. when you walk up to someone and say, "Hey, I remember you. Oh, that was a pretty good. Do, do you remember?" It's like, and the guy's like. Not, oh, I don't remember. It's like, oh, how's it going? So walking in, shouting that to a guy on the other side of the room got me into a place. Walked to the back, um, sort of uh, asked the, uh, the, 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 the whole, um, uh, just trying to fi find the, the chain of thought again. Um, but it's basically engineering your way through that even is, is, mm -hmm. a, really, is, is a really easy way. And asking for things so i'm already at the desk i've already sort of been verified by someone else that didn't even know me doesn't matter went to the desk and said hey can i get the the keys to the it cupboard and they reached down got the secure key card and keys and gave it to me on my hand and then pointed to the door and then carried it on working where it is sort of they didn't say hello nothing i just walked up with a smile to the face pointed to someone else and that's all that was required to get into a, a it cupboard i didn't have any specific clothing or nothing just hey okay so. and, and what i did as a child well as a young man when you try to position yourself into someone else's life and then you already know them right and so i guess there was this one time uh, I can't remember the children's name, but they were basically twins. Mm. And what happened was they came to me and I said, okay, so you must be Daryl and you must be Darren, right? And I looked and said, like, whoa, sir, how did you know that? <laughs> it's like, I'm a little bit psychic. Whoa, <laughs> it's like, no, Mr. Stefan told you. It's like, no, 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 I know. I was like, even if you mix up and I close my eyes, I know exactly who you are. What yeah. happened was their mum put their names on their, on their jackets <laughs> and they just don't question it. It's like, <laughs> yes. oh, that's <laughs> it's so like, cool. Yeah. Darren, is that how you doing? 
So they were there for shot put. I was still a teacher and we're doing athletics and all kinds of things and they were there for shot put. Yeah. I said, I'm going to prove to you that I'm a bit psychic. You're going to throw between this many meters and this many meters. Ah, okay. And it's like, he throws, it's like, right in the middle. Whoa. It's like, yeah. Now, I've got a clipboard that says what he's throwing, right? So all the previous throws, is, I've just took average. an average, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, now I'm psychic. And it's just that easy. And I said, look, you probably, your mom cares about you a lot, but you probably have difficulties with your dad. And it's like, Whoa, that's so accurate. It's like, look, their mom took the time to embroider their jackets with their names. They, they dress exactly the same, right? There's no distinction yeah. between them, really. So obviously, they've got a very doting mom. They've got packed lunches, like, you know, it's like all kinds of things. And, and they're big guys, right? So I can imagine that they probably have, the big guys probably 17, close to 18. So they're going to have some friction with their dad, right? That's just normal. It's like normal, this, yeah, exactly. it's part of life. It's part of life, right? So they're gonna have some friction with their dad. And, uh, and right, it's like, you know, it's like, it pulled my psych maneuver, you know, it's like, I didn't lick anything, <laughs> but it was. <laughs> and That's so you it. know, you know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, they, they went and told everybody that I'm psychic. Mm. And so when someone comes to me, it's like, okay, it's like, you know, and I just basically did the Sherlock trick, right? Like if you we, if we yes, watch Sherlock, yes. the British, version yes where he just basically looks at you and it's like sees okay I so mean, from the way in your yeah. right shoe your right hand yeah, it's, yeah, yeah yeah but i mean it's it's much more simple than that you don't have to be so fine yes. in the details sometimes if people don't shave and they've got like a very loose casual look about them you can say look i think you're very into the creative and you know it's like you're making some basic judgments on people if they come with a suit and tie and everything's picked perfect it's like you care a lot about the details and, and you like yes, the procedure yes. and it's like, whoa. It's like, you know, it's like, <laughs> I, I, it's, just, uh, it's just these basic things. When they go in, it's like they grab your hand and try to crush it, right? That's sort of power yes. play. It's like, you like to take control. You like to get things done. Yes, you don't yes. take shit and I need to bleep that. You don't take nonsense. <laughs> and, <laughs> you don't take nonsense from anybody. You're a sort of go-getter. Well, that's exactly me. And the other part is people agree with anything that's positive that you said about them. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Then you get the Swami or whatever he's called, like uh, he's a psychic that comes to my door, right? And he, and he basically says, no, he's a psychic. So, okay. And he says, you are a very lucky and organized person. It's like, wow, you, you, you are useless. Because <laughs> none <laughs> of those things, things apply to <laughs> Worst psychic ever. But it's so easy, really, to just... So a pen test is basically like a short for penetration test, right? Correct, so correct, yes. It's, it's basically that easy. It's like, hey, Jim. Yes. But, you know, it's like... And if you just go to the company's website, chances are the CEO's name is on there or whatever, right? Yep. Or the, the head of IT or something, right? Mm -hmm. or the person to call. And it's like, no, 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 Charles sent me. It's like, no, he's, he's his number, right? It's like, it's on my phone. <laughs> like, <laughs> they, they brag about showing that information to show you how big they are as a company. And normally they try and inflate that information yeah. because nobody wants to seem as a small startup company. They always want to be bigger. They, you know, want to bat above the average. Yeah. And so they'll give you, they feel that giving you more information shows you that we're bigger than what we actually are. Yeah. So you get a lot of information. Enumeration is part of the whole pen test thing where you would go through and try and find all of this data and build little profiles of every person and may find some release passwords or whatever the case is where they were involved in breaches. And you can go as far as maybe getting into someone's mailbox just by trying to find data about them because you can build profiles based on I don't know, um, lingo and um, nicknames and email addresses and stuff like that and when you eventually are on site you know so much about them because you're just using something as basic as that every guy going for an interview almost does where they do a little bit of research show that they know the values of the company and then they expect the company to treat them better because they've done that effort to learn you. And it is basically that way. If you can show a bit of truth, like you did your example with the twins, 
if you can show that, if you can um, show that you put value to the person, give them good feedback, um, reaffirm what they're saying, ask a lot of questions about them. You number one, close the door at them asking you what are your what are you doing there? Because if you ask them about their time spent, what they do, how good they are on certain things, oh, I hear you type fast. Did you did you study to type? How fast can you type? You know, go into something as basic as that and they'll start talking and they'll give you little nibbles of where you can branch out the conversation at one point, they would feel they've been, they've known you for years, but the, it's the exact opposite. You know them, but they still feel that information yes. and it just branches out from there. It just opens up so many possibilities just because you listen, spend time and ask questions instead of giving information. And that's also a big thing where if you ever in that negotiating factor, the moment you can switch the position of ask who's asking the questions from on you to on them, you get away with so much and you're, you're basically in control of the, the, the scenario when you do that. So, and, and that's especially, what... yeah, it's fascinating to mention that because I'm busy now with the framework of my next book called think like a fighter, right? Mm -hmm. How to grow your small business. And part of that is networking techniques. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I tell people is that, it's like I do workshops and networking as well, not the type of networking that you do. So, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> so people, people network, right? <laughs> yeah. You need me, I need you. I, 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 yeah, yeah. So, it's, uh, so I've got something that I call my Q don't quick and dirty yeah. operational networking technique. And it's basically, it comprises of six steps. And I say you that you don't go to networking technique if you don't know who's going to be there, right? That's number one. If I don't know who's going to be there, then I don't know who to target. Because you, what ends up happening is you go to a networking event and then you see, oh, there's Jim from, you know, it's like from IT or whatever, right? Then you go to that person and you basically spend the entire networking event talking to that one person that you already know. Which you already know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and which completely, completely ruins the entire idea of why you're supposed to be there is to network. And then it's yes. like you've done your research, right? So you've, you've, you've studied them. Most people now are online in some form or another, right? You can research them. And if they are important enough that they need to be a networking event and you need to contact them, then do your research and yes. find out what their pain points are, right? And then just ask some questions and then find out some fun things that they're doing. Uh, because people, it's very difficult to get people to talk about themselves, but it's very much easier to talk about what they do. Yes. And to, if you can solve a problem for them, just based on a the conversation, they trust right. you more because you're listening to them. So, and that's because they, they, because I tell people it's like LinkedIn is not for your, you know, what I'm eating now sort of a thing. And I hate the fact that I put in all hearts and smiley faces and all kinds of bull crap. This is not, this is not Facebook. Why is LinkedIn trying to be Facebook? That's a conversation with everything, but it's, it's there to network. Right, this data expands your network. So you need to contact these people, you need to ask questions, you need to research them. And it's, it's as simple as that, really. Just, so in my next book, Think, uh, you know, think Like a Fighter, How to Grow Your Small Business, that's part of the networking and how to build an entrepreneurship. And we go through the whole, you know, traditional forming, storming, norming, performing stuff and all kinds of things. Ah, that's brilliant. You know, I, love, uh, I love that. It's, it's something we've actually started adopting or not adopting. We had a, um, a guy come to us and sort of just do a bit of talking and inspiration and sort of sorting it out. And that's where I learned from the whole, well, knew about it, but really learned from him about um, norming. Yeah. So once you understand that, it is brilliant. Because you know that there are times when any new company has to go through those stages, right? Yes. So every new team, every new department, they're going to have a forming stage. They're going to have a storming stage, basically fighting over who's in charge and who needs to do what, all kinds yes. of things. Then later on, they're going to move into, you know, uh, the norming where things are set up down now and they can actually focus on what they need to do and then performing. Now I come in where you are performing, but you're going down again, right? Yes. You're with, moving back down yeah, the train. You're moving back now. Or if he's a plateau, you're not really being more creative. You're not really coming up with new ideas. And then I come in and I run a workshop on creative thinking techniques and product development and communication and creative, creative thinking and kinds of things. 
And so then that company boosts their creativity. It doesn't last forever, right? Mm. It's, it's basically there to, to get you out of that, that little rut. problem. That rot, right. And so the companies that say, um, it's like, they, 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 they feel like they're still doing okay. You know, they're not doing as well as they did, but they, they're still fine, right? But they've been doing fine for like four years now. So where they are, <laughs> right, they've dipped now for, okay, it's like this thing is now, like, so they dipped now a little bit and they say, I'm fine, I'm fine, right? So they started getting, dipping out here and it's like, they're dipping lower, it's like, I'm fine still, you know, I'm making a profit, it's not that bad, it's fine. Then four years later, from where they were to where they are, it's like, I'm going to make this a bit more dramatic, it's like, from where they were to where they are, right, but they're still being fine, they're still fine. It's still class is fine. Yeah, it's still yeah. classes is fine, because they didn't see the big leap, the big Yes. Difference, right? Which is why Apple's also successful. They just release a slightly better version every year, right? Yes. But when you look at where they are to where they were, right? I mean, it's a big difference from the iPhone 10 or whatever it is now to, to the first iPhone, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you didn't even have an iPhone, you had an iPod. The iPod touched yes. it, and it's yeah. like all kinds of things. And then they put <laughs> the iPod touch with the phone together, and it's like, bang, you got an iPhone. I had all those things. <laughs> Right, I had my iPod Touch and my iPhone, and I took the train for ten hours from Auckland to Wellington, all kinds of things. But uh, if we keep on saying we're still doing fine, we're still doing fine. If you're not growing, you're slowing. Yes, right? yes. And you have to understand how to scale the sales and all kinds of things that I'm covering in my new book. But uh, let's just get this one done first. So then. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but this has been a wonderful talk, and I really enjoyed it and i surprisingly enjoyed it actually because we haven't really spoken um, in like 10 15 years it's more than 10 yes. years because like yeah and it must be because i left south africa when what like it was like 15 17 something like that and um it was still high school the last year of high school yeah, yeah so it's we, we're talking what 2000, 2003 yeah 2020 20 years ago <laughs> man <It's> like, <laughs> Jeez, we old man. We old man, I tell you now. It's like we're old buggers. It's like back in my day. <laughs> we had to dial things with my hand. Like uh, Pepper just farm remembers. <laughs> farm remembers. <laughs> oh, yeah. So anyway, it's been surprising, wonderful to talk to you for a variety of reasons. And it's nice to get to know you better and what you do and all kinds of things. And of course, you know, if your company is looking for a professional speaker or, and, you know, a workshop facilitator, hit me up and I'd love to go back to New Zealand and do something creative. Definitely. And I mean, if you ever hear of someone that needs IT security, that kind of thing, I mean, yeah, we can do a think, lot you know, of remote work. So. Because I actually think, you know, rather than asking me to do something that I have no clue about, getting mm. the professionals to do what they do best. Yes. So yeah, so there's definitely companies that want the IT infrastructure, like, you know, assessed and all kinds of things. And mm. I don't know who's actually capable of doing that in Namibia. Mm. Um, because it is a small, it's a big country with a small population and not enough highly skilled professionals, I want to say. So yeah. yeah, and you know, of course you can use that as a PR opportunity, how, you know, you're getting this company from New Zealand right to, yes. to yeah, yeah. You know, it's like to, to assess your structure because you care so much about your people and their security and their data i said there's exactly. another opportunity it's not just you know i tell people everything is a marketing opportunity everything is a public relations opportunity just position it correctly the, the quicker you understand that as an individual and mm. the quicker you utilize it the better because mm you'll be missing out on more than you'd actually be losing. A lot of people probably fear it or they think, ah, oh, it's not for me. I'm not a speaker. I'm not a, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm an IT guy. Mm -hmm. I'm not someone that you're expecting to see on a camera. And this is like the, I don't know, the fourth or fifth video, something like this yeah. that I've done where it's, it's good. It's entertaining. It's, it's, it was really awkward in the beginning, but if I don't do stuff like this with you, how would people learn, know, understand? Plus, you're creating links and correlation between items that are similar, but so complete opposites of what they actually are supposed to be. It's just insane. And once you start snapping that, you think, ah, oh, the world's actually so simple. Once you start understanding it and know how to use it. Because I tell people it's like, it's, 
you think the world is complicated, but it's not complicated. It's just designed. It's just that most people don't have the manual, basically. Yes, right? Yes. So most people haven't thought about how to, how to work the system, how to manipulate it. And that's what creativity is all about. It's about thinking better, going that extra step in your thinking. And I call it shortcuts in thinking, right? When you don't do that. Like yes. that guy that came from an electrical company and I just let in, right? Like that's a shortcut in my thinking. Because no. I, I, <laughs> like, <laughs> because like I, I criticize people for taking shortcuts in their thinking, right? But I'm not immune to it. Just because I, yes, and that's, yeah. And it's good to know, and it's good to have that self reflection as well, that introspection. Hmm. It's like, look, there's sometimes where I just take a shortcut in my thinking, and I should have verified the guy first before just letting him into the office. I, I mean, it's like it worked out fine that time, but who knows? You know, who knows? Who knows? That's exactly it. And so that's why what you do is so valuable, you know, with your pen test. I think pen test just sounds better than penetration test, maybe. Maybe that's just why <laughs> yeah, they call it yeah. pen test. <laughs> pen like, test. Then I'm like, oh, the ladies. <laughs> We're going to have to delete that part too. Well done. <laughs> Oops, thank <you. laughs> So just, but it's, it's positioning it in a way that people can understand. Right. Yes. So pen test, I first thought it's like, yeah, okay, you're going in with a pen and you're just like, you know, it's like clicking. It's like, yeah, yeah. I see, yeah. Da, 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 da. Pen know, works. That annoying little, Pen's got ink. Pen's got ink. Yeah, pen works. So, yeah. So now it's fascinating what you do. Uh, it's really cool. And I think that uh, I, 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 I know that people need it because I know that I've, I need it. I need someone to check my systems and see. It's like, look, man, this is not secure. Yeah, it's just a yeah. Your website is just basically a digital flyer, but you still need to protect your data. Yes, your data and your client's data. And, and a lot of people data. don't 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 think they need to think that far because they mm -hmm. think it is. Uh, I mean, once the words are on the website, who really cares about it? And you'd be surprised who would find that as a, a a thing that they can utilize for their own means. And that's the point. Regardless if they're going to use your data or get onto it to spoof as someone else, you never know. And that's the point. So, so we sort of went off topic with this conversation, but it's basically it comes down to negotiating people, places, systems, devices, yes. negotiating between minds, negotiating your way into something. And it's all a matter of frame persuasion, I want to say almost. And Correct. that's really, so, Anybody who listens to this and sees this, because it's going to be up on the, on the Facebook group. And it's wonderful to, if you want to have a discussion, if you want to have a talk about how you've negotiated or how do you see negotiation, then please send an email to info at thinkbonwest.com. And I'm happy to talk to you as well. There are links in the description for the podcast that Peter mentioned, as well as the IT360, I believe, is the company's name yeah. in, in, in New Zealand. If you feel that you need to have your systems audited and to see what maybe your security company is doing about your IT infrastructure, then hit them up and see what they can do for you. And remember, everything's negotiable. With that, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you to Peter because it's now like 10 o'clock there at night. And uh, <laughs> I'm just guessing, but let me see. That's yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's like 9.59. <laughs> <laughs> Spot on. Spot on. So, yes. Okay, well... This 40 minute conversation lasted a little bit longer, but it's fine. <laughs> Happy to. I mean, it's, it, it was a two front thing. It's like, I haven't seen you in a long time, plus all of this. So. All of this amazingness, yes. So, yeah. with that, uh, signing off, and remember to think like negotiator because everything is negotiable. Peter, thank you and stay awesome. Thanks, Brent. You as well.